last time uh, we were talking about John Wesley's um, meeting uh, with a young Moravian leader, Peter Berla, um, and the dialogue that they had, especially in terms of the nature of saving faith. What is saving faith? Uh, and yesterday we talked about uh, saving faith in terms of two H words in English, happiness and holiness, or in terms of two P words in English, peace and power. And that corresponds to the theological understandings of justification on the one hand, that is the forgiveness of sins, and then secondly, uh, regeneration, the renewal of our nature uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Wesley is coming to understand by means of this dialogue that he lacks, he lacks saving faith uh, because uh, he lacks uh, the kind of faith that Peter Berla was describing here. And so afterwards, uh, in March, uh, Wesley met with Peter Berla once more. And then Wesley recorded in his journal on March 5th, on March 5th, 1738, by means of his conversation with this young man, Wesley, now listen to this, Wesley, think about John Wesley now, priest, missionary, he was clearly convinced of unbelief. He was clearly convinced of unbelief, quote, to use his own language, of the want of that faith whereby alone we are saved. And so Wesley is basically saying here, uh, I am in unbelief. I do not have saving faith. I have faith, but it is not saving faith. And so he is humble enough and honest enough to recognize that. And that, of course, uh, is always a good thing. So then he turns to Peter Berla and says, well, if I don't have saving faith, maybe I should stop preaching. Maybe I should not go into the pulpit. And then Peter Berla uh, responded to Wesley and said, quote, Preach faith till you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. Okay? Now, I actually think this is good counsel. I think it's good counsel. I don't think it's insincerity. Why? Because if you are an ordained priest like John Wesley was, you have a, a what? You have a duty. You have a duty to preach the gospel on Sunday mornings, okay? And the preaching of the gospel should not be subject to the vagaries of your own spiritual experience, okay? Uh, because the congregation has the right, if you will, to hear the gospel. That's what they should be hearing on Sunday morning. And so I think this is actually good counsel. And uh, I've been told that some preachers have actually been convicted by their own preaching. They've been convicted by their own preaching. And they, this gentleman right here, uh, convicted by their own preaching and they enter in. So uh, see very clearly here that all of us who are in, involved in the life of the church, whether we be a preacher, whether we be a teacher, we have a duty. We do. We have an obligation. The congregation has the right to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the expectation, and we must do it. We must do it. So I think this is actually a very good counsel. So uh, the, the next day, which is March 6th, and some people uh, look at this as Wesley's intellectual conversion. In other words, now he understands very clearly what saving faith is. He knows. He knows up here. 
He doesn't know here yet, but he knows up here what saving faith is. And so he begins to preach. He begins to preach what he is calling this, quote, quote, new doctrine, this new doctrine. Uh, though he writes, his heart was not fully in it. And I think this is very interesting. The first person he offered salvation by faith alone, sola fide, because that's what Berla taught him, the Lutheran teaching of justification by grace through faith alone. Uh, the first person he offered this salvation to was Mr. Clifford. Mr. Clifford, who is he? He was a prisoner under the sentence of death. He was under the sentence of death. Now, think about that for a moment. That's actually very interesting, very important. It shows the kind of change that John Wesley had made in his theology. Remember, I told you earlier, he had read Jeremy Taylor. Jeremy Taylor, well, you know, if you read Jeremy Taylor's works and some of his other works, uh, he did not believe in deathbed conversions. He believed simply you were out of time. You did not have enough time to do the rounds of repentance, to do all the works that were associated with repentance. You wouldn't have enough time. And so Jeremy Taylor specifically, I've read it, specifically in his writings, rejects deathbed conversions. You're out of time. Too bad for you. You're out of time. Okay. That represents a different kind of theology. And Wesley, Wesley had taken up that theology in his own understanding. So the fact that he is offering salvation Yes, salvation by grace to faith alone to a condemned criminal who will be executed soon. In other words, who has little time, very little time left. And Wesley is saying, you can be converted. Why? Because it's not about what you do. It's about what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And you must Receive, receive it, receive it by grace through faith alone, by grace through faith alone. So this is an important shift in Wesley's theology. And the fact that he preaches salvation by faith to Clifford, a condemned criminal, is very important. It's an important piece in the story. It shows the big shift in Wesley's theology now, okay? So, towards the end of the month, Peter Berla explored the nature of saving faith in greater detail with Wesley, and he continued to affirm the two fruits that are inseparable from it, namely, holiness, which is freedom from sin, and then happiness, which is peace and joy which emerge from a sense of forgiveness. And Wesley, of course, looked at uh, his Greek Testament to, to think through this doctrine, think through this teaching, uh, as Berla had communicated it to him, to see if it was of God. And he was convinced, he was convinced that this was sound scriptural teaching. The thing that Wesley could not understand uh, was that Berla had insisted that this faith is given in a moment. Uh, in other words, it is given instantaneously. Uh, and so Wesley still could not comprehend how this faith could be instantaneous, given in a moment, as Berla had suggested. But, so what does Wesley do? He consults the Bible. He looks at the Bible once more, and he is surprised to find out that scarce any instances, instances there uh, of other than instantaneous conversions. Uh, scarce any other so slow as that of the Apostle Paul, Wesley writes. 
So what's Wesley saying there? Well, in the scripture, in the Bible, there are numerous instances of instantaneous conversion or conversion over a brief period, a brief period of time. Uh, and indeed, one of the early biographers of John Wesley, Southey, uh, was simply incredulous at this point. He wrote, is it possible that a man of Wesley's acuteness should have studied the scriptures as he had studied them till the age of 35 without perceiving that the conversions which they record are instantaneous? Okay. And so it is important, however, that we understand this issue of instantaneousness correctly, instantaneousness aright. Um, neither Peter Burler nor John Wesley uh, taught that believers must know the exact time, the exact moment, or even the precise day or hour of redemption. Uh, they're not saying that. For example, I'll give you an example of what I mean here. Um, uh, the late Ruth, um, uh, Ruth Graham, uh, the wife of Billy Graham, uh, before she died, uh, she was interviewed uh, about her conversion, her evangelical conversion. And they asked her, they said, you know, are you born of God? She said, yes, yes, I am. Uh, you know, do you know exactly when you were born of God? And she said, no, I don't. I don't know an exact day. I know after reflection back upon it that it happened somewhere over here, so to speak. And, and that's perfectly fine. So with this emphasis on instantaneousness, we're not suggesting like John Wesley, you have to know the exact date or hour. You do not. Uh, what should be in place, however, are the fruits of the new birth, the fruits of conversion. They should be apparent in one's life, okay? And, and one can see that one is changed. All things have become new, etc. You may not know the exact day or hour, but you know it's changed. Think of, think of it this way. Think of a man and a woman falling in love. Think of, uh, you know, can they pinpoint the exact day that they fell in love or the exact hour? Probably not. Probably not. But they know that they are in love. They know that their hearts have been changed and transformed at some point, whether they know that point or no, or not. It's the same way here. And again, uh, let me say, because this is an important point, and many critics misunderstand this whole area. They misunderstand it. Um, it doesn't have to be dramatic. In other words, we're going to see John Wesley's conversion was rather dramatic, uh, but it doesn't have to necessarily be dramatic. I can share this. In my own journey, my own walk, uh, my own conversion, my evangelical conversion. I just woke up one morning. Uh, it was a Saturday morning. I was in my mother's house after I had graduated college, and I simply believed Jesus Christ was who he said he was. I believed he was the Redeemer, uh, that he could save me uh, from the guilt and power of my sins, and I entered into that liberty. Uh, you know, there were not marching bands, that, you know, there were not fireworks. Uh, it was a quiet, simple belief and rich understanding that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. So, what, what's another way of looking at this? There is psychological diversity. In other words, people come to Jesus Christ in all sorts of ways. Okay? All sorts of ways. Some have a, a, a dramatic conversion experience. Okay? Maybe they were suffering under drug addiction and they embrace Christ and wow, it's a, it's a huge dramatic change. That's wonderful. We celebrate you. We... we, we express joy with you. For others, it will be different. It'll be slow, it'll be, they'll enter in, they'll come to an increasing awareness and they know that they have been transformed and they have been changed, okay? So there's lots of diversity here. And what we don't want to do, we don't want to take someone's experience, 
like Wesley's, for example. We don't want to take his experience and say, oh, all Christians must be like this. All Christians must come to faith in Jesus Christ this way. No, no, we don't want to do that. There is diversity, lots of diversity here. Now, watch this, however. There is soteriological. What does that word mean, soteriological? It has to do, well, it comes from the Greek word soterios, which means salvation, and it has to do with salvation. And here, there's going to be sameness because we know the same Lord. We have the same spirit. We are exercising the same faith so that we have common, a commonality. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, if you will. So in terms of conversion, in terms of conversion, there is, there is psychological diversity. People come to Christ in all sorts of ways, and we celebrate that. We celebrate that richness. But there is a commonality as well, a soteriological commonality, in that we know the same Lord. Uh, it is the same Lord who comes to dwell in our hearts, okay? And we know the same Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, okay? And so this is very important. Um, and we'll talk more about the instantaneousness as we go further in the course, because it, it's, it's an important point, okay? Um, now, uh, I'll say one last thing on this before I move on. Uh, the instantaneous simply means that grace has become actual. In other words, it's no longer simply possible. It has become actual. Okay, so there's the difference between possibility. See, I may be many things by the grace of God, but what am I actually? What am I actually today in God's grace? And the instantaneous is a window on that transition. Uh, I may be possibly many things in God's grace, but what am I actually today? And, and the instantaneous puts the focus on that. So, so that uh, is, is good indeed. Well, uh, Wesley's obviously very impressed uh, with Peter Berla. Uh, and he's impressed with his sanctity. And so the two of them work together. And so the Methodists and the Moravians are working together uh, in London. And they found a religious society. They, they form a religious society together at Fetter Lane in London on May 1st, 1738. And... Um, According to Wesley, in his writings, he says it was modeled on the Moravian system. And so Wesley appropriated, borrowed uh, some of the Moravian wisdom in terms of how they structured groups and structured associations. Uh, and Wesley listed 11 rules of this joint Moravian and Methodist society established at Fetter Lane. And this society, like the Methodist societies established earlier at Oxford uh, and in Georgia, underscored the basic truth that Christianity is a social religion, uh, and to turn it into a solitary one is to destroy it. Uh, that the Christian faith ever prospers in face-to-face -face relationships, okay? So, Wesley uh, schooled in a Moravian Lutheran understanding of faith because that's what Peter Berla is communicating to Wesley, in, in a sense, the theology of Martin Luther, especially in terms of the issue of justification, okay? Uh, and so, uh, Wesley is, has taken up this understanding uh, and now, as he goes through these changes, he is something of a puzzle. He's something of an oddity to both friends and foes alike. And so uh, a certain Mr. Broughton, upon hearing Wesley explore the nature of saving faith, uh, 
he basically objected to John Wesley and he said, quote, he could never think that Wesley had not faith who had done and suffered such things. And so what Mr. Broughton is saying, he's saying to John Wesley, uh, you know, because you were a missionary in Georgia, you had to have saving faith. And John Wesley says, no, no, I did not. I did not have saving faith when I was in Georgia, okay? I fell, I rose, only to fall again. That was how Wesley described his experience there. Uh, now, Wesley, of course, as an Anglican priest, is going into Anglican pulpits on Sunday morning. So he's preaching, he's preaching. And then when the Anglicans uh, you know, hear him preach, they don't like what they're hearing. They don't like what they're hearing because Wesley is teaching in the pulpit that we are justified by grace through faith alone, that we don't have to be or do something else first in order to be justified, uh, that it is a sheer gift, a sheer gift to be received by faith. And so what do they say to John Wesley? John Wesley, preach here no more. Preach here no more. And so Wesley is basically thrown out of all these Anglican pulpits, St. John the Evangelist, St. Andrews. Um, he's also cast out of uh, St. Catherine Cree, St. Lawrence's, St. Helen's, St. Anne's, St. John's Wapping, St. Bennett's, St. Antolin's, St. George's, Bloomsbury. All these churches said to John Wesley, preach here no more. Wow, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. Because in order to have a revival, in order to have a revival, okay, you need three things. You need three things for revival. And one of those things looks like it's not going to be in place. Okay? What do you need? You need first of all, you need first of all good news. Good news indeed. You need the gospel. You have to have what is, and I say this very carefully, the gospel is the greatest story that has ever been told or that could ever be told. There's not a greater story. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're at the University of Tallinn or Tartu and in the English department, you cannot come up with a greater story than the gospel, that the greatest, the highest comes, and not only comes, but humbles himself among men and women. And not only does that, but dies a death on the cross at Golgotha in the midst of mocking, torture, and shame. You cannot think of a greater story than that. So we have in the church the greatest story that has ever been told or that could ever be told. And you're now understanding something about that story in terms of the two fruits, the two fruits of salvation, which are wonderful, wonderful gifts, justification and, and regeneration. So you have to have that in place. In the church today, you know, we can look at 18th century England, we can look at 21st century Europe, 21st century North America, there are people in the pulpit today who are not preaching the greatest story that has ever been told. They're preaching something else. They're preaching somebody's politics, maybe somebody's leftist politics, maybe they're preaching psychology, therapy, uh, self-love, self-understanding, self-therapy, some nonsense. But not the greatest story that's ever been told. So you need that in place, and not everybody has that in place. Not in the 18th century, not in the 21st century. But then you need more than a message. You need more than that. You need persons, people, who, are, who have been transformed by the message. Who, in other words, not only believe it with their minds, but live it, live it out with their hearts, their minds, their thoughts, their hearts, all they do. Someone, in other words, who is the real deal. 
that they practice what they preach, so to speak. They practice what they preach. They are living, living out what they're preaching in the pulpit, okay? And, and, and Wesley's going through that transition now, uh, as you realize. He's going through that transition now, and, and it's basically, it's coming in place, okay? So that's the second thing you need. And, and we don't have that uh, everywhere in every pulpit today, uh, nor in the 18th century. In other words, people believing and living into what they are preaching. And then you need the th third thing in order to have a revival. What do you need? You need to be able to reach the people. You have to reach the people. And if you can't reach the people, you're not going to have a revival. You're not going to have a revival. You're not going to have a great awakening. Um, and so it looks like what's happening here uh, in terms of John Wesley, preach here no more, that he's losing his audience. Okay, he's losing his audience. And so that's a very important uh, situation. Now, Wesley's relationships were strained. They were strained in the Anglican church. You can see that. He was cast out of the pulpit. But they're also now strained with his one-time mentor. Remember we talked about William Law? William Law was the mentor of John Wesley, okay? Uh, well, there's tension there also in that relationship now. Uh, and so on May 14th, 1738, uh, John Wesley complained to William Law that he had been preaching after the model of his two practical treatises, in other words, a practical treatise upon Christian perfection and a serious call to a devout and holy life. We talked about those two books yesterday. Um, and uh, Wesley is saying, you know, I, I've preached in accordance with your works here. Um, and I grant that the law of God was holy, uh, but no sooner did Wesley try to fulfill it, but that he found it was too high for man to use his own words, and that by the doing of the works of this law, no living flesh may be justified. No living flesh be justified, Wesley exactly writes. And so what Wesley is basically communicating to William Law here is that he now has this teaching, this Lutheran teaching, coming from Martin Luther, of justification by grace through faith alone. And he's basically asking William Law, why didn't you ever teach me this? Why didn't you ever teach me this? Uh, and so um, uh, Wesley confessed to William Law that he had continued in this path that was recommended by William Law until, until God had directed him to a holy man. Who is that holy man? Peter Berla, of course, Peter Berla. And what did Peter Berla teach John Wesley? Believe and thou shalt be saved. Believe and thou shalt be saved. And so Wesley clearly saw, at least by this time, on an intellectual level, um, what saving faith entails, and that saving faith is a gift. It is a gift given to us uh, by God. And so, exasperated a bit at this point, uh, maybe even a little bit somewhat angry, uh, Wesley criticized Mr. Law even more pointedly, and he asked directly, Here's the quote. How will you answer it to our common Lord that you never gave me this advice? You never gave me this advice. Why did I scarce ever hear you name the name of Christ? And so this is what Wesley is ask, you know, addressing to William Law. And so you can see this relationship. There are tensions here now, uh, very strong tensions here. Um, and so the heart of Wesley's criticism and why he is criticizing William Law 
has to do with, again, the nature. What is the nature of saving faith? That there are two things ever associated with it, as we, as we noted earlier. And so uh, Wesley writes uh, about the nature of saving faith in light of this conversation with William Law in the following manner, quote, I know that I had not faith unless the faith of a devil, the faith of a Judas, that speculative, notional, airy shadow which lives in the head but not in the heart. And what is this to the living, justifying faith in the blood of Jesus, the faith that cleanses from all sin, that gives us to have free access to the Father. And so this is how Wesley is thinking about the relationship with William Law. Why didn't you teach me this? Uh, because now I understand what saving faith is, and you never talked about this uh, to me. Uh, and so Wesley here is obviously earnest. Uh, he is distinguishing that faith which pertains to nominal Christianity, uh, which is speculative, which is notional, which is an airy shadow under which he had suffered for so long, uh, and um, he is distinguishing that faith, that nominal Christian faith, from the living, justifying faith in the blood of Jesus. And so uh, we see here Wesley clearly giving evidence of understanding uh, saving faith in terms of happiness, from a sense of forgiveness of sins, and then also holiness in terms of power uh, that is associated with the reception of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, while all this is going on, you know, this tension between John Wesley uh, and William Law, there are things happening with Charles Wesley. I mean, Charles Wesley is also growing and making a transition, if you will, and so Charles Wesley, like his brother John, was well acquainted, was well acquainted with Peter Berla uh, and had profited much from his spiritual care and direction. Uh, by early May 1738, for example, Charles Wesley also had understood the nature of what the one true living faith whereby alone through grace we are saved. And so later that month, uh, and this is rather interesting, I'll make commentary on it when I, after I'm done here. Uh, later that month, uh, Charles Wesley began to read, which I found to be a very precious book in my own spiritual journey, Luther's Commentary on the Galatians. So he read that. Uh, and I think it's one of the best books that you can read uh, in Christian literature. Actually, the way it's published in the English edition, you have to read two volumes if you're reading the 1735 edition. But it's Luther's uh, commentary on the Galatians, on, on the book of Galatians. And it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. And, and, it, and, it's, and I've, I have greatly valued it as well. If we want to understand what is the nature of saving faith, if we want to see that very clearly. What does faith look like? Saving faith look like? Well, Luther lays it all out there very clearly. And so Charles Wesley is reading this and he is shaken up because he had been taught an Anglican theology in the 18th century that was moving in a different direction, moving more in the direction of, of where Jeremy Taylor had been, that sort of thing. And so uh, Charles Wesley writes in his uh, journal, quote, who would believe, who would believe our church, of course, meaning the Church of England, who would believe our church had been founded on this important article of justification by faith alone? I am astonished I should ever think this a new doctrine. And so what Charles Wesley is saying here 
is that you know, in reading this Galatians commentary uh, and in understanding that his own Anglican heritage during the time of the English Reformation in the 16th century actually taught justification by grace through faith. Uh, and somehow or other, he came to think that this was a new doctrine. No, it, it actually had been a part of the English Reformation. And so this is... Uh, uh, something of a puzzle for Charles Wesley, okay? Um, and so, like his older brother, um, Charles wanted a living faith. He wanted a living faith, to use his own words, not an idle, dead faith, uh, but a faith which works by love uh, and is necessarily productive of all good works and all holiness. Uh, and this is what Wesley... Charles Wesley is arguing. So he too wants, desires uh, saving faith. On Friday, May 19th, while Charles was in bed, uh, and there's some discussion among scholars about who plays what role here, Mrs. Turner or Miss Musgrave, and I'm not gonna get into that, but I'm just gonna describe in general, in general, uh, the details of Charles Wesley's evangelical conversion. Uh, and so Charles, as seems to happen much more than with John, was sick. He was sick. He was ill. He was in bed. Uh, that sometimes is a good place to be for people because you're sick. You stop. You reflect. You think about things. Your regular daily existence has been interrupted. You may be open to thinking about things in new ways. So uh, that could be a good setting. Uh, and so Charles Wesley is sick, he's in bed. Um, and a certain Mrs. Turner told him that he should not rise from his sick bed until he believed. Uh, in other words, until he believed savingly. Uh, and so Charles Wesley wanted to find out if this woman was sincere. And so he asked her a question. Has God then bestowed faith upon you? Yes, he has, came the reply. Not yet satisfied and in a way reminiscent of his older brother's questioning. Charles Wesley asked this woman once more. Then are you willing to die? See how focused he gets? He asks her, are you willing to die? And the woman responds, I am and would be glad to die in a moment. Uh, and so this woman's testimony, uh, this witness to the liberating graces of redemption, no doubt prepared Charles in some measure for what was to come. Two days later, uh, Charles heard someone come into his room, and we're not exactly sure on this. There's, and uh, while he lay in bed, uh, he heard someone say distinctly, and this is what they said. This is what he heard. Quote, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and believe, and thou shalt be healed of all thy infirmities. End of quote. Uh, and so whoever said this, whether it was Mrs. Turner or Mrs. Musgrave, this is scholars go back and forth on this. They argue about it. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but at any rate, upon hearing that, Charles Wesley receives it. He receives it. And then he records later on, he had a strange palpitation of heart. He had a strange palpitation of heart. And he said, yet he feared to say, I believe, I believe. And so we see here this significant actualization, realization of grace in the life of Charles Wesley. And he records in his journal, and he writes, the day of Pentecost. Now, it happened to literally be the day of Pentecost. Uh, it, it was the celebration in the church calendar of the day of Pentecost. Uh, and so... We have just described, if you didn't catch it along the way, Charles Wesley's evangelical conversion. So, Charles Wesley, the younger brother, enters in 
first. He enters in before his brother John. John's evangelical conversion has not happened yet, okay? Uh, but it is to happen very, very shortly. Okay, let's take some questions or comments you might have. Uh, oh, it's good to stand up. Oh, I should stand up more. <laughs> okay, questions, comments? Yes, I see a hand over here. Отрицала, получается, эту благодать э, по вере, да, э, и когда по вере, да, где-то не склонялись, получается, к делам каким-то, да, больше. Вот здесь вот как-то прокомментируют. Well, it's not, that, it's not that I'm commending that particular theology. Uh, I am identifying that particular theology. S what, I'm su what I'm suggesting, and I'll express it simply in this manner, and, and I've studied in this area of extensively, especially the English Reformation. Uh, indeed, I teach a course on the English Reformation, that in the 16th century, the Anglican Church uh, the Anglican Church uh, so clearly taught uh, justification by grace through faith alone. We see this, for example, in Cramner. Cramner is a key figure here. In Cramner's homilies, the homily on salvation, for example, uh, we see it very clearly in the Anglican materials of the 16th century. Um, Cramner, by the way, is also the one who was behind the creation of the Book of Common Prayer. Now, what happens, however, as we move into the 17th century, and that's the time of Jeremy Taylor, and Jeremy Taylor, along with Lancelot Andrews and others, are known as Caroline Divines, okay? And what the Caroline Divines are teaching uh, is moving in a different direction, a slightly different direction than what it was in the 16th century. Because you've heard me say already that uh, Jeremy Taylor did not believe that you could be redeemed in a very short period of time because of his understanding of repentance and what was entailed in repentance and the works that are suitable for repentance, okay? Um, so this theology from the 17th century comes into the 18th century, okay? And so it's being taught. Now, there's also the Anglican materials, like the Book of Common Prayer, like the homilies on salvation, that are still being passed along, but so the official teaching with documents is one thing, but what's actually being lived out and practiced in the 18th century is something different. And Wesley himself writes that the common fault, I'm paraphrasing here, the common fault of Anglicans uh, in the 18th century is to confuse justification with sanctification. In other words, to make holiness, the holy life, the requirement to be forgiven. And Wesley admits that he himself had done that very thing, had made that same mistake. And so uh, there are a couple of things going on here. There's what Anglicanism officially teaches in terms of her documents, that's one thing. And then given this tradition, this heritage that is expressed in the 18th century, there is another thing. Uh, and that's where the confusion comes in. So that's why Charles Wesley, for example, says, ah, this is a new doctrine when he hears it from Peter Berla. Uh, but then he realizes, no, 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 this is not a new doctrine. 
As a matter of fact, our own church, meaning the Church of England, has actually taught this. It has taught this you know, from the Reformation forward, very clearly. Uh, and so we have this, this, this difference. And this is at the heart of John Wesley's misunderstanding of saving faith, why he misunderstood it for so long, because he had been taught an Anglican theology that was out of harmony with Anglican official materials and documents, yes. Okay, other questions, comments? Good question, by the way, good question. Other questions, comments? Yes. William Law. Uh, John Ah, oh, yes, yes, uh, that's a very interesting uh, question. Um, they still uh, have some dialogue and conversation, and then in the 1750s, they have uh, you know, uh, other discussions, um, and there are some tensions there as well in the conversation that takes place in the 1750s between John Wesley and William Law. But John Wesley did not uh, convince William Law to come over to John Wesley's understanding of what saving faith is, no. Uh, William Law uh, was quite comfortable in his own understanding here, his own teachings as expressed in his books, so no. Um, uh, William Law did not come over to John and Charles Wesley's understanding of evangelical faith, uh, no. He did not. Yeah. yeah. Other questions, comments? What, what about his mom? What about his mother? Um, his mother, uh, during this time, uh, is looking at all of this, uh, these changes that are happening with her son. Uh, actually, Sam um, Jr., the older brother, uh, is speaking and writing to his mother and is concerned about the faith of John and Charles Wesley. And so that concern is communicated to Susanna. And she, you know, is wondering, uh, are, are all things well? Uh, uh, but. Later on, uh, Susanna sees very clearly the evidences of the transformation that has taken place in the life of John Wesley and Charles Wesley, uh, and she is at peace with the kind of transition uh, that they've gone through. Um, in terms of Sam Jr., there's actually some correspondence uh, between Samuel Wesley Jr. and John Wesley, and they're going back and forth on this issue of the nature of saving faith. And we'll actually talk about that, uh, you know, probably this afternoon. We'll talk about it this afternoon. But uh, Sam Jr. is taking exception. He's objecting to this evangelical theology that says or that teaches that we can be free uh, from the power and dominion of sin. And, and Samuel Wesley does not affirm that. And, and they go back and forth on that. And John Wesley says, no, we have this kind of liberty in saving faith. And, and Sam Jr. is questioning it and criticizing it and implying no. Uh, and now, I've also related that later on, and I don't have the exact date yet, I've been doing so many different things lately, um, that Susanna Wesley has her own evangelical conversion. Uh, this is what, what many uh, have argued, what many have argued. 
uh, when she received communion uh, at the hands of her son-in-law, Wesley Hall, uh, while she was in church, that she received the forgiveness of sins and she had the assurance of faith. In other words, she knew that she was the beloved, that she was a child of God, that Christ died for her, even her, you know, to use her son's language. Uh, so she eventually enters into the very same kind of reality already known by John Wesley and Charles Wesley, and so Susanna Wesley, though she had initial concerns because she was listening to Sam Jr., uh, she eventually entered into the, kind, the same kind of evangelical faith, that's what I'm calling it here for want of better words, uh, she, she entered into the same kind of evangelical faith as her sons. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to say it.